Yo, and I don't really know, ever know where to start with you because there's so much going on in Mexico yeah. where you're reporting. But let's start with your book, Blood Gun Money, because you were on there in 2021 when it was released, first of all. And uh, it's been updated and is out again. But because of the significant developments that have happened somewhat around it, changes in law and the Mexican government suing the Americans about the flood of, of weapons over the border. Yeah, yeah, some big things happening. So in August 2021, uh, the Mexican government uh, filed this lawsuit, totally unprecedented, uh, against 10 U.S. gun companies, uh, including the companies which make guns, uh, which import guns and, and distribute them uh, in these firearms coming to Mexico. So for people who did uh, this, this issue, you've got this gun trafficking from the U.S. domestic gun market to Mexican cartels. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about estimations of more than 200,000 firearms every year going south. So an iron river of firearms going from the US to the Mexican cartels. And here in Mexico, it's been a complete bloodbath. And we get uh, more than 30,000 murders every year mm. um, here. So like, you know, 300,000 murders the last decade. It's kind of mind boggling uh, covering this, just the body count, you know, you're covering and you get lost in this. Um, but anyway, so this was was filed, this lawsuit in Massachusetts. Mm. Um, and now it took a while till late last year that the judge did throw this out in the end and said, the judge said, I'm sympathetic to this case. I'm sympathetic to what Mexico is going through. Um, but you can't, you know, sue U.S. companies from the Mexican government. It's kind of opens up a bit of a can of worms. But the Mexican government appealed immediately and also they filed a new lawsuit against individual gun shops. So basically you get, you know, m most, most gun sellers are fine and are not involved in this. Like 90% of gun sellers are not selling to criminals. But you've got 10% of gun sellers which sell a lot of guns to criminals. Mm. And I'm not talking about like one or two. I'm talking about cases where they'll sell in a single sale 500 firearms to somebody who's moving them to gang members. You know, people going in there buying. I mean, there's, there's there's cases of what they call straw buyers, which are people working for the cartels. There's, there's a case in Arizona where somebody spent um, uh, half a million dollars on 700 weapons for the cartels. So these, these are really big cases of gun trafficking that are not being clamped down on. Yeah. Uh, so they refiled that. Now, that helped, uh, and I think, a lot of the um, publicity and talking around this by, by journalists and the, and the Mexican government doing this help really get this on the agenda. So now you have in these like bilateral talks with Mexico, US, and these talks about the drugs, which is a very, very grave issue, which we'll get into with the fentanyl and overdose deaths. But we you know, talk about having guns on the agenda as well. Mm. And then we saw uh, this Bipartisan Safer Communities Act uh, approved in the United States. Um, and quite quietly, they had a big uh, section on gun trafficking. Now, one of the things I emphasized in the book was that there was no federal gun trafficking law mm. in the U.S. And most of the time, people being prosecuted were on very minor things, things like lying on a form rather than working for a cartel to supply them with firearms. So for the first time, they put in these kind of federal firearms trafficking, start going after these people, these straw buyers that I talked about who are people who are paid to buy guns for the cartel. Um, now, we'll see if that's that's applied. There's been some kind of big developments and the issue continues to be very, very hot. At the same time as this, you've got a lot of violence in Mexico, a lot of fentanyl overdose deaths in the United States, and an increase in the rhetoric uh, from some of the Republicans saying that we need to send in the military against the cartels. Uh, and so kind of a heating of tensions there. So so a lot of things happening around mm. this issue with firearms and the cartel paramilitaries and the United States. And were the Mexican government trying to make a political point as well? Because you just hear that one way traffic that the Mexican cartels are corrupting America. Are they trying to make a point that this is a two way street? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you talk to the foreign secretary about this, who Marcelo Ebrard, who was the guy who bought this, he's quite diplomatic. I mean, he's a diplomat. And, and so he's like, oh, we're not telling Americans about their laws. We're simply saying, you know, we've got a case of this. This is not a natural phenomenon of, you know, two million firearms coming over in the last decade, going to some of the most violent criminals in the world. And we're trying to defend this. But 
obviously it has political impact. And, and now the, the, and there's kind of two sides. I, I do think it is a, it a good strategy after a lot of years of covering this bloodshed. And it seems there's no way out. So, so I like to try and see any positive attempts to find a solution to this problem. And I think it's a strategy with two things. One is to, you know, if you look at a lot of the uh, changes in the practice of these industries which have harmful consequences in the United States, including the tobacco industry or the pharmaceutical industry, then it's often through lawsuits that changes are brought about rather than just through, uh, you know, legislation. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is political, it has a political impact, obviously. And so now there's this kind of generally, uh, there wasn't really, I think, uh, a couple of years ago, much public conscious about this issue. And now there is. I suppose that one of the most significant things that's happened since we spoke anyway was the um, the trial of Gennaro Garcia Luna, who mm. um, was the Mexican security minister. And he was actually convicted of drug trafficking in the US. Mm. I think people know more about El Chapo Guzman convicted in 2019 than they do about this individual. And really, in a way, is it not even more significant that a politician of his level has been before courts in the US has been convicted and is now jailed than Chapo, who was a criminal always and certainly not pretending to be anything else. Yeah, so General Garcia Luna, uh, I met him right going back to 2005 when he was a rising star in Mexican law enforcement. He had a kind of tough jaw. Um, he wasn't particularly well spoken. He kind of mumbled, but he had this kind of tough cop look about him. And at the time he was head of this federal agency, which is being sold as being the equivalent of Mexico's FBI. And there's some big ideas about fighting organized crime. Became then the public security minister under Felipe Calderon, kind of led, was one of the, the big figureheads leading this crackdown on, on drug cartels. And then there he was. And I went up to the first week of the trial and saw him there. It's a very, very changed figure. Um, kind of gray hair, looked pretty beat down after a couple of years in prison. Um, but the, the trial... Even though I kind of covered this, this for, I mean, I've covered this stuff for 20 years and you know the stories and hear the stories about the corruption, it was still kind of painful to see the witnesses say it on the stand um, just about how corrupt uh, the Mexican government is in many cases with this. And, you know, there was the things like, well, we, we were giving, you know, you know, you know, millions of dollars every month and, you know, these gangsters coming on the stand saying we were going there with a, a bag full of dollar bills, giving him this money. Uh, but also the, one of the things that really got me was going back to 2007. Mm. There was the biggest cocaine seizure in world history at the time. 23 tons of cocaine seized off a ship um, going in, in the port of Manzanillo, going into Mexico. Covered this at the time. Seemed like a big deal. You know, 23 tons of cocaine. Uh, it was burned. There were stories about it burned with a kind of brass band playing in the Marines there. And they had a gangster on on the stand saying, well, Actually, we got the real cocaine back. Oh, we gosh. created our own factory where we made fake cocaine with flour and sugar. And we made this fake cocaine uh, and then like made these little you know, bricks of cocaine packets, exchanged them from the real cocaine, working with the corrupt officials. And what you saw burned was the fake cocaine. And that was like, oh, oh it's my like, God. yeah, yeah like, that answers my, my next question, which was, was Luna corrupted or was he always corrupt? And he obviously always was because he did make a lot of changes when he started out, didn't he? But obviously he was on the take for years then. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to get your head around, uh, you know, when you sit in a room with some of these guys and they're like, they seem they're talking a good game and they seem very good at it. They seem very good about convincing you they're the kind of they're the honest cop who's going to change things you know this corruption is going to be put behind and then really you kind of see on this there that you hear there's some kind of criminal mastermind as well so um, I, it's, it's hard to really figure out what they're thinking uh, maybe there was a certain idea of we have to work with some of the criminals because drug trafficking is going to happen anyway mm -hmm. so we've got to work with some and we can kind of work with them to go after the more anti-social gangsters so, you know, if you see during this, this time when he was running things, some of the most the most anti kind of anti-social gangsters, if you want to use the, that term, were the setas um, who were, you know, they were behind some of these really big mass graves, mass beheadings, um, leaving, uh, you know, a ranch with like 300 bodies dissolved in acid. So the government was kind of going after them, working with 
other cartels to go after them. And maybe that's how they justify it in their own mind. But, you know, it's kind of hard to get into their head sometimes. But is is it universal, do you think, that level of corruption? Like, is it? they're not saying this is one bad apple, which is what we always hear over here. Like, is it everywhere through the security services? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, very, very grim. I mean, I did a separate trial I just got the documents for recently was, and I had a cartel guy who was the leader of a Juarez cartel. And he said that they believed the, the federal police going into the city to fight them. He, he believed that 90% of the federal police were working with the Sinaloa cartel. And they put a car bomb against the federal police for that reason. That's why you know, he justified that reason to use a car bomb against them. Um, now, if it's anything like that numbers or that numbers in a, in a certain place, I, I, mean, I mean, it is it is it is very broad. So, you know, they, they, they have a saying, um, you know, who needs there's, there's an old saying. Um, you don't need the angels if you have God, uh, meaning that if you have the boss of the of all these police officers, you don't need the angels because you've got God on your side. But there's another kind of flip side of that is you don't need God if you have the angels, if you've got all the cops mm. on your the low down cops on your side. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's very, very deep. And then so you start getting into talk of a narco state. Um, now, you know, it, it, is, is the kind of state corrupted and acting in interest of drug traffickers rather than the public is meant to represent? Um, and you do see that and elements of that. Um, one thing I would say to try and uh, kind of have a saving grace for Mexico is the state is kind of a many headed beast uh, and you get many elements of the state which are functioning. So you get school teachers going every day, teaching kids, people collecting rubbish, uh, doctors and nurses working very hard. So you get these kind of functional elements of the Mexican government. And I think if we say that the entire thing is bad, the entire Mexican state is bad and we should treat Mexico kind of like North Korea or something. I don't really like that idea either. So I think we have to kind of look, still try and look for the good people and try and save this. But but it is grim. I mean, I've got to be kind of realistic and not naive about this. It's very grim. So Luna was first mentioned as being corrupted during the El Chapo trial. Joaquim El Chapo mm. Guzman. Like when you look at it, is the state creating the cartels rather than the cartels being created by these sort of Farmers. I mean, Guzman was a, you know, he was a, an uneducated farmer from a hillside, wasn't he, who became like the biggest drug trafficker in the world. Is it possible for that to happen without the help of the state and all those corrupt officials? Like, So what you see is uh, with the cartels and with these gangsters, they've kind of created this shadow or parallel state um, themselves. I mean, you go to these, these towns and cities and... Uh, they're running things. I mean, at a time when I talked to a, a, a cartel uh, member in the city, we were trying to negotiate with with him about having permission to film there. Sad to say as it is. Uh, and at the end, he said, if you have any problem with the local police, just give me a call. <laughs> um, you know, like basically, he's above the local police guys there. Um, so you kind of see this, this, this kind of parallel organization entwined with the state. Um, but they still have their own kind of force and logic as well. I mean, they, they've got, you know, El Chapo, El Mayo, El Mencho, these these gangsters, these warlords kind of have their own structures as well. Now, I mean, yeah, you know, they they, they, they wouldn't have grown to their power if it hadn't been for corruption. Um, but I think it's, um, we're kind of dealing with, it's not quite as, as simple as they work for the government in the same way, like let's say the, um, the revolutionary guard of, of Iran does. Um, these are kind of, you know, separate things. I, 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 sometimes maybe the the parallels to something like in Northern Ireland, where you have some of these Protestant paramilitaries, um, which are kind of fighting like, um, you know, independent organizations coming out from these neighborhoods and characters. Then they might coordinate with 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 police on certain things. So something like like that sometimes helps. Another kind of uh, Northern Ireland parallel I, I see sometimes is. When I first went into one of these these prisons, which was totally gang controlled, and you had these different wings run by these different cartels, um, and they had self government in these wings, and it kind of reminded me of, of what I read about these um, kind of prisons in Northern Ireland, where you have Protestant and, and Catholic uh, uh, prisoners in, in there, kind of running their own wings. Is a point. <laughs> he does have a point. I mean, yeah. and the, the the relationship between the loyalist paramilitaries and the the Northern Irish state was was they both fed off each other and would try and use each other to for their own ends. Mm. And it was a it to, they conducted a dirty war that way, really. You know, um, 
it, it definitely was a, a murky, murky business. It's easy to look outside and see, uh, you know, bigger problems than you see within your own sort of communities, isn't it? Um, so look, there's so, look, what about we have to ask you about uh, El Chapo's son and the shootout and all the rest of it and covering these kind of stories like um, I, like that looked like uh, like from a journalistic point of view, a very exciting story to cover. You're probably over that, are you? After so long in Mexico, it seems like these kind of massive big stories come along. You only get a little break in between them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's so it's kind of very, very surreal. A lot of this stuff. Uh, and so, you know, like it's like, you know, any any crazy thing can happen. Um, you know, like just if you look over the years covering this stuff, you know, suddenly when I, I remember like uh, when Chapo, when we talk about when Chapo was in prison and then someone said, could he escape again? And I was like, no, I don't think so. He can possibly escape at this point. And then bang, get a phone call on a Sunday morning when, you know, like Chapo's escaped again from yeah. prison. So these kind of crazy things happen. So with Obidio Guzman, I mean, so this is kind of a, a part one, part two, kind of act one, act two uh, with Obidio Guzman. So act one was 2019. Um, so he, well, he's one of the sons of El Chapo. They're, they're part of a group they call Chapitos, which is kind of a faction in the Sinaloa cartel. Very important. Very big on trafficking uh, fentanyl and crystal meth to the United States. Really got under the eye of the United States. Now, the, this fentanyl issue, and we can get into separately if you like, is, you know, is really kind of raised the stake because the level of death. Mm. So the U.S. putting real pressure. Now, in 2019, there's an arrest of Obidio Guzman. It actually has about 100 police and soldiers involved, a kind of uh, a, an advanced squad and a kind of secondary squad trying to shield the place they're arresting him. But uh, the Chapitos people, they get 700 to 800 gunmen onto the street within hours opposing them. More soldiers come. Uh, you get, you know, it's kind of very, very insurgent tactic. I think a very, very significant moment um, in, in, in the whole conflict we've seen here for the last 20 years, um, uh, uh, where you get the, these gunmen really kind of outgunning the government. And the government, after four hours of, of big shootouts happening, of, 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 of people who are picking their kids up from school being trapped in the schools, um, or, you know, people being in the supermarket and they're not like, locking the doors because it's at the outside, just crazy, and just gunmen have just taken to the street. And then eventually, after four hours, the government giving the guy back and backing down. Um, and, and I talked to this, this one uh, family, a Mormon family, who, who had nine uh, women and children killed in 2019 by gunmen and actually met the president. And they said in the private meeting there, the president said to him that what he regretted most in his presidency was letting Obidio Guzman go there. It kind of was a stain. Every time you write, you know, when I, I did this, when I wrote stories, I'd write, well, the, you know, there's accusations of corruption and he let Obidio Guzman go. So it was kind of uh, killing that demon, uh, removing that stain. So what they did this time, a uh, very well planned operation. They claim it was spontaneous, which I think is just for some legal, funny legal reasons, but it's clearly planned. They had three and a half thousand soldiers this time. Uh, Obidio Guzman was in a village um, called Jesus Maria. It was funny. People talk about who gave the information. And, and what's funny is there's a, a famous song out about Obidio Guzman called Soy el Raton. Uh, I'm the mouse. That's his nickname, the mouse. And it mentions this village in, in, in there. So you could listen to the song and you might know where the guy's hiding. Right. Um, they, they went in there with three and a half thousand uh, soldiers. Lord, killed a lot of people, got him out, um, but took him uh, to the airport and flew him out very fast. Now, the gunman did kick off again, but they got him out to Mexico City. One of the big incidents there was, you know, as the gunman were firing at the airport, there was a passenger jet with like families and regular people on board. And they were having these gunshots coming and hiding. There's video of that, which obviously creates a, a big upset. But they got him out to Mexico City. So kind of a success for the Mexican government. A lot of casualties, uh, probably innocent people got killed in that. I mean, a lot of people died there as well. Uh, I mean, the war carries on. It's extraordinary, like for one man. So will he be tried in Mexico or has he been extradited to the US? He's still here in Mexico right now. Um uh, among things, uh, so so he's fighting his extradition. Um, one of the things he threw out early on was saying, uh, the, the lawyer saying, oh, it's not him. It's not Obidio Guzman. Um, it's not, you haven't got the right guy, which kind of throws it out, but I think it's simply a delaying tactic. So they may, may make them do DNA and so that kind of thing. Another thing he said was um, he needed medicine because he's got a bad stomach and he's suffering from depression. <laughs> um, you know, so you know, <laughs> these kind of, these guys, uh, but Obidio, um, he's, he's a, uh, 
I think within these these brothers, um, and El Chapo had a lot of sons and daughters. Um, this is one group of four of them are the main Chapitos. Mm. Um, and I think he's kind of maybe considered a, a weaker link among them. The fact that he was exposed and taken down twice. And there's this uh, elder brother called Ivan Archibaldo, who's considered the leader. Um, and a lot coming out on him right now. There's a big indictment with the, about it from the United States about him. Um, a pretty tough character from what's coming out, um, and and a pretty you know he seems to have ordered a lot of a lot of murders. Yeah, so he'll be he'll be next probably to be targeted. But these seem to be yeah. like mm. they just seem to be doing the same thing over and over again, getting out these big guys, these big names, bringing them to America. Okay, like it was it was something else to see Chapo getting tried, and a lot of information came out with it. But they seem to leave behind too much of the gang structure. Um, it's a kind of, can they not create a new policing cross-border blueprint to maybe take out more of that cancer and, and, and leave less less behind to keep operating? Well, yeah, this gets back to the, the, that, that kind of problem of, the, of there's a whole drug war strategy. Um, I mean, yeah, El Chapo was something special. El Chapo, in some ways, you could see it's accumulation of the war on drugs. I mean, it started, the war on drugs, you know, officially launched by Richard Nixon in 1971. Um, 73, the DEA is created and they start to build up these things of going after the international drug traffickers. Pablo Escobar, they kill in Colombia. So El Chapo was the biggest drug trafficker they have on trial in the United States. I would say he's one of the three most infamous gangsters of the last century with Al Capone and Pablo Escobar and El Chapo. Mm -hmm. um, again, a real trip seeing him in the trial. I mean, you know, standing near him and seeing this kind of larger than life character um, right there, you know, on the dock. Um, but in the dock, but like, um, um, like, where do you go from there? And, and, you know, you, you raise a very good point, Nicola. I mean, like you, you take El Chapo, you take, you know, Orbidio, we get, you know, just more kind of nicknames. It'll be El Mencho, uh, you know, mm. all these different, all these different people. What does it do? The thing is, I mean, you take out, I mean, there's also, as well as the, the, these bosses, there have been, you know, low, every day you hear of these kind of lower down guys being arrested. The thing is, in Mexico, you have, um, you know, it's a country with 32 states. Just there's a whole bunch of cartels in different places. So it's like, how do you rethink the strategy of this? Now, it can go different ways. I mean, one thing is, do you want to go more, um, you know, do we need to legalize more drugs to take away some of their income? Marijuana is only half legalized still now. Um, can like more legal. Like, the problem is though now, you know, I, I argued back in 2012 in editorials um, that oh we have to legalize uh, marijuana to take money away from cartels because they were big in that business then. And I was like, why are people buying marijuana and that money is going to uh, you know pay for these hitmen and all this damage uh, affecting Mexico? That happened, or to half to an extent, there's like a lot less marijuana being trafficked now. But now they've got into far worse drugs, mm. fentanyl, crystal meth. So I really honestly don't know what to do about that, apart from saying that America really needs more uh, kind of rehabilitation and more work on trying to treat addicts there. Um, the other thing is then, do you, do you create really serious law enforcement? We've seen El Salvador right now, um, there's President Bukele, who incarcerated 1% of the population um, over nine months uh, to tackle the gang problem. Um, it's the equivalent of you know incarcerating 3 million Americans in a nine month period you know, real uh, kind of unprecedented stuff there. Um, and it really shut down the gang issue uh, and people are really celebrating him. Now, I don't know if it's going to work a long time. He totally trampled uh, human rights and civil liberties with that. Um, but that's something which is successful. And you could see whether I like it or not, whether we like it or not, mm. more Latin American countries pursuing those kind of authoritarian measures in the future dealing with these crime problems. I mean, did the rise in fentanyl, which the Chapitos have really been the main movers behind, haven't they? Like that's that poses loads of different problems for for America. Like, as you said, the, the rate of death and then the involvement of the China in, in the production of of these drugs. Like that is ultimately where where fentanyl is coming from through Mexico. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, when I started Covering this stuff, it was about 15,000. It's 2,000. About 15,000 Americans would die in a year from drug overdoses. You go back to the crack epidemic, all that talk of that, like 1988, 
less than 4,000 Americans died of, died of drug overdoses. The figure for the last full year, full year is 107,000. So absolutely devastating. And, and then that, from that point of view, you know, the Republicans, well, I don't agree with the idea of you're going to just bomb your way out of this and bomb Mexico. They have a point. This is a huge political issue. I mean, we had, um, you know, the policy of, of governments directed towards public health for many years over COVID. But like, really, I mean, 107,000 dying in a year. And we're talking about many of them, young people in the prime of their lives. Um, I, I was just in the United States uh, giving talks uh, and a woman came up to me. At one of the talks there, her, her son, a student at university, had died of fentanyl. Uh, I mean, absolutely devastated. And, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of cases like that right now happening. So really, really crazy what's happening with this. Um, and, and, and it is a game changer. Now, fentanyl, this gets into kind of some of this, this chemistry. The, the big change has been a revolution in drugs that we haven't seen in Europe, but we know you've got to keep your eyes out for this happening in, in, in Ireland, in, in the UK, in, in mainland Europe. Um, it's this revolution where instead of having a drug where we're going to go, okay, cocaine, um, we've got the, the coca leaves, grow these plants, go through a you know, lab process and make these bricks of cocaine. Uh, we're just messing around with stuff at, you know, synthetic, uh, moving stuff. So we start to get into the pharmaceutical industry, the chemical industry, and then creating incredibly strong substances, um, you know, much stronger, you know, like people talk about these numbers. I'm a bit cautious about using some of these numbers, but like 50 times more potent than heroin. I mean, it is very, very strong stuff, you know, whatever, and 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 you know, very small. I mean, you can put like, it, 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 I could have a, an a equivalent of like a, a cup of coffee worth of, of fentanyl being taken in, and that can kill like, you know, millions of people. <laughs> Um, so it, it's very uh, efficient for smuggling. Then they then use this to pad out other drugs. So they'll get heroin and just pump a bunch of fentanyl into it. They'll get cocaine and pump fentanyl into it. Fentanyl into it. So people who've died, you get like musicians, um, you know, more like kind of yuppies who take a bit of cocaine, who then died of this stuff. Mm. Um, uh, you know, so so a real game changer. And you then get into like dealing with substances, you know. You know, I've been looking at this a lot the last the last year, and you start having to try and get your head around. It's no longer like uh, these customs people looking for bricks of cocaine. Mm. They're looking for precursor chemicals with weird numbers that aren't even illegal. Um, you know, you have to start trying to get your head around and talking to like people with people with PhDs in, in chemistry. Um, we're getting these front companies are very much changing the game of how it's produced and the profits are absolutely out of this world. I mean, you can buy these precursor chemicals, which are coming out of these main industries in China very cheaply and turn that into, you know, a small amount to turn into a million dollars. So even we thought cocaine profits were insane. You know, this is insane on steroids. But it could put the uh, the Mexicans out of business, perhaps, because surely it doesn't have to come through Mexico at all, does it? You know, if they can import it directly into the States and make it and create it there. It, that could happen, and that might be the future. Uh, it, will they do that? I mean, one of the things that, that the Mexican cartels and Mexican traffickers have been very adept at in the last few years is taking advantage of the U.S. market. Um, you know, they can have a lot of these big labs, um, you know, out of you know in the mountains or mm. out of sight of, of kind of law enforcement. So you know, with crystal meth. Um, when and this is connected, the fentanyl and crystal meth businesses are very connected. It's all using precursor chemicals, turning it into these very dangerous substances. Substances. So you had in the US the, the big production of crystal meth for a lot of years. Then you had in 2005, I think, called the Combat Methamphetamine Act in the United States, trying to clamp down on that, clamp down on buying precursors about what you could do about you know going to these chemists to buy certain medicines, which you would then you know turn into crystal meth. They kind of clamped down it there. So it flipped to Mexico very quickly uh, and they were very, very effective. Now, maybe, um, you know, they'll, they'll do it in the US. But right now um, it's been efficient mm -hmm. um, and, and the Mexicans have, have taken advantage of this, of, of this business. And they know the market, of course, and they, you know, they're, they're there. Is, is marijuana uh, sales completely flagging or is the, the, the export of it completely flagging as a result of the legalization? You still get some. I mean, it's way, way down compared to before. Mm. Um, 
you know, but you still get some, uh, and that's kind of crazy as well. I feel you know now we might go through and and and, mar- and legalize marijuana properly. So now you still have, uh, for example, on the Texas border where it's you know, or California, it's it's more legalized, and so you actually get this high grade weed in California. And you know, what's the point in bringing Mexican weed into California? Um, in Texas border though, you still get marijuana being smuggled in. So you still have now people are buying weed in Texas, and, and that money is going towards these cartels. An interesting uh, flip side on this, though, is you started seeing, first of all, you started seeing this kind of high grade weed being smuggled from the US market into Mexico, kind of a niche market of the high grade weed. <laughs> that if you've been to one of these uh, marijuana dispensaries, cannabis dispensaries in, in LA, I mean, you walk in there, they've got all this stuff on sale in these kind of boxes. So they'd be buying that and bring it to Mexico. Then what they did, and this is interesting, the, the Chapitos are behind this. Um, and again, they're, they're, these are, these are, business people as well as being violent warlords they created their own dispensaries and i went into one of these dispensaries in in culiacan sinaloa um illegal still or mexico is trying to legalize weed as well but it's kind of hasn't got there but the chapitos just went ahead and did it anyway so you walk in there and they've got these different high-grade marijuana now growing here in mexico imitating the la dispensaries um but here kind of run illegally or semi you know like underground and, and no one really clamping down on that here Mm. They sound like sophisticated delis to us. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know. These but are. I was, I was in Toronto recently, where of course it's legalized, and just this, the bang of weed the whole way up the streets is quite extraordinary. Now they're two or three years in. I think people have started to calm down. Right, but you could get that bang in Dublin you, anyway without you, you legalization could. at times. But this is just no. This is just unbelievable. The smell of it, and I think people are saying that a lot traveling to New York and places as well. There's you know, it calms down, I think, though, you know, it's legalized. Everyone goes absolutely bananas for it and then it'll it'll calm down a little bit. But you're looking at, I mean, the, the argument really, as you're saying, of putting these gangs somewhat out of business by legalizing it is no longer probably something that could go into the political agenda unless somebody wants to start talking about re- legalizing the likes of crystal meth and fentanyl, which is on nobody's radar, really. Yeah, so with the drug, uh, kind of the drug policy reform debate, uh, and, and, and I don't know a lot of the solutions to this, you know, I don't tend to have clear answers, uh, but I have thought, you know, a lot about this in recent years. And I, I do believe now with with weed, with, with, with marijuana, there's no point in going back to making it illegal. The kind of gene has come out, and I think you should try and fully like legalize it and try and break that chain from from organized crime mm-hmm. with that. Uh, then we get to the other issues, the, the other drugs, though. Um, now, I mean, one thing is, I mean, the United States has got like this this drug problem, you know, which you can't compare to other countries. I mean, why is there so much use now? You know, why is rehab been ineffective? So when we talk about harm reduction and the phrase for me, the phrase harm reduction meant, you know, was different from the kind of abolitionist approach that you'd hear Richard Nixon talking about back in the 70s. Or you would still see like some UN conference on drugs uh, having in, in the in like around you know, the late 90s saying, well, you know, there was there was a UN conference. We said a drug free world. We can do it. And it was kind of like seemed like, you know, pie in the sky stuff. They're not being realistic about this. We have to accept those drugs and reduce the harm reduce the deaths of overdoses, reduce the deaths of, of, of fighting. However, from what I understand, and I need to kind of investigate more in this report, more on this, from what I understand in the West Coast of the United States right now, uh, San Francisco, LA, um, Seattle, you've got these supposed harm reduction programs where they're kind of not really working. You've got a very, very high numbers of people dying of, of drug addiction, people taking drugs on the streets, people selling drugs on the streets, um, and it's not working. So we have to think really what does it mean in terms of the approach what kind of rehab programs? I don't know how successful they are in Ireland. Whether you know, there's a growing and significant um, drug problem in Ireland um, with, with addiction and a lot of people suffering with that. So I don't know, you know, how much you know is is a you know government run rehabs? Should you force somebody into a rehab if you can't you know get them taking you know crystal meth or or, or fentanyl? Should they be forced so you have to go to rehab? Um, do you need to have more charities stepping in with this? You know, what are the best methods? Can you really get people off this? 
this methadone works. A lot of questions there um, about how to try and reduce this, um, you know, and, and just try and reduce this, this kind of people spending all this money, which goes to cartels, but also just trying to uh, stop the, the devastation of families that you have with this. There's no doubt that the, the state has to spend more in rehab facilities here. And I'd imagine in, in, in the US that a lot of it is left up to charities and mm. probably not regulated properly. But I mean, the fentanyl crisis has actually brought down the average mortality rate in America like it is incredible. And, um, mm. you know, whether the state could uh, like it's such a toxic substance, I don't know if the state could legalize it and you know it'd be it but it's it's no, such it's a, too toxic surely a substance i mean the yeah. point of it is the strength isn't it and yeah. the fact that it's been mixed into everything nobody so, takes a drug though and wants to die they take a drug and want to high no but there's so, some there's some drugs even like like heroin if you had you know proper pure heroin you could probably take it for a long time and not die but and that's fun, not they have programs in the us i was looking at some of them that they're actually giving heroin out to people yeah. they bring them in and they'll take their they're actually living quite you know structured lives and everything else calms down the chaos of their lives calms down when they are actually given the heroin but I don't think you could say that for, for crystal meth like if you're being pumped full of crystal meth no, things are not exactly. going to stay s- they are total stable. game changers these drugs and you know w- you know as people who are working in it and politicians and everybody sort of comes to sort of I mean having lost the ability to come up with solutions for the likes of cocaine, yeah. all of a sudden there's a new wave about such a complicated has problem, hit in the States and is probably about to hit Europe. Like, as you say, yo, and everything that happens there is kind of, you know, it's it certainly it could be on its way. We never had that same crack cocaine. No, but I mean, we do tend epidemic to be... as such. It is in use here. Yeah. And there is yeah. a fear that it will become in more use with people who, because it's cheaper, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so one thing, uh, I was up in Tijuana and the, the, in some places, funnily enough, or, or kind of, you know, it's interestingly, the cartel will ban sales of fentanyl locally to Mexican people here because they'll be like, like in Sinaloa itself, the, the real cradle of drug trafficking, they'll say, we don't want you selling fentanyl. We don't want our own people and our own, you know, hitmen and our own families being affected by this, but we're selling it to the United States. Mm. Uh, in Tijuana is different. Tijuana is, is this border city where it's, you know, it's, it's always been a lot of drug use there on the streets. It's very connected to the US. Loads of people deported from the US kind of there. So there they've got this big drug use area. It was in this canal where a lot of drug users would hang out and there's a kitchen there. So I went there and I spent a lot of years talking to people who use drugs, you know, even going back in the UK to the 1980s and 90s. I you know, knew people who, who use heroin and and, and and we talk to them, and you, know, you, can have, you know, can have perfectly good conversations with people who take heroin. But I found some of the people who were taking, they were very heavily on, on meth and fentanyl. I mean, these people were zombies. I really could not have um, mm. coherent conversations generally with these people. So I had the effects of them as well on, the, on their just, on their, you know, these people just become really knocked out. Now, I guess one thing is, yeah, I agree. You can't really, you don't want to give them out fentanyl. There are, I mean, you could say if somebody's um, basically an, an opioid addict, they want some kind of downer, mm-hmm. you give them a methadone. I think there's some other ones now which are a little bit, uh, um, you know, not quite as hardcore uh, or even or better than methadone. The problem is as well is that methadone, you might have somebody, and I saw this back in the UK, even in the you know 1990s, somebody was like, well, so I'll take uh, methadone. They call it in, in England, they say, I'll, I'll get, the, get a script, get a prescription, get a script for like methadone. And then they take it, but it's not really a, a big enough hit for them. So they sell it on the street and then they, they, they go and use that money to go and buy heroin or whatever. So, so you could still see, you know, like a, a problem, a problem there with dealing with this. But no, absolutely. This is something to watch you mm. know, big time in Europe. I mean, you know, what one of the things in, in the US, I think, as well, is that they've had this very aggressive pharmaceutical industry for many years, which was prescribing. Um, so, we, you know, they used to have oxycotine. You know, this is the, the big scam of the Sackler family, but prescribing it very easily. Some would go in with, you know, not that sick and they give them oxycodone. They get addicted. And, and a culture in the U.S. of just taking pills. You know, and if you're in America, you got you look on the TV and you see all these adverts for like um, these, these, these Psychiatric drugs. drugs and everything. Like it is, it yeah, just yeah. rings so wrong to mm, us. That yeah. it, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so, so there's this culture and the power of the pharmaceutical companies 
had, and, and then this has kind of led, and, and this is a derivative of the pharmaceutical companies, these synthetic drugs. I mean, fentanyl was was painted and is still used in 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 medicine commercially around the world. So we, I think it may it makes us ask some very hard questions about society and about the role of pharmaceutical companies. Have they got too powerful? Um, are they kind of abusing and, and and what control can we have? But yeah, definitely to something to watch out for. Can you, you see the effects of this? Um, you know, you think it looks bad now, um, you know, in, in parts of Dublin, in parts of Scotland, um, it could get a lot worse. Mm. The um, money that the court heard that uh, Gennaro Garcia Luna managed to take in suitcases or bag loads from the Sinaloa cartel and others, where did it go? Like, I mean, you were talking millions and millions and millions there. I noticed that uh, some of them and most of the evidence given during the course of his trial was from drug dealers um, themselves, gangsters themselves with no backup from non-gangsters, the evidence. But nonetheless, was there like, you know, when we talk about drug money, I lose trace of the zeros at the end of it. And these guys are still talking about physically handing over money in bags. Like, how does that work in the real world, in the ordinary world where the rest of us live? Yeah, well, well, one of the things about about the government has been very bad about finding most of this drug money. Um, it, with El Chapo, the prosecutors said we want 14 billion dollars. We believe he's made 14 billion dollars. Um calculated kind of on this kind of bit, estimating this amount of you know cocaine and, and street sales um if you have a guess about how much they've got back it's a big zero so far mm-hmm. of 40 billion with el chapo garcia luna as well it was like well they couldn't prove and this was i mean to be honest with the trial um and th- this was shown right from when they selected witnesses they were like telling the witnesses will you convict the guy just based on so they were telling the jury members mm. in jury selection, will you convict a guy based on protected witnesses who are gangsters? And only that. And eliminating people who said no. And although I believe do believe Garcia Luna was guilty, um, I also think these gangsters would lie to reduce sentences. They make deals. Now they it might be a case where they were bribing him, but they, you know, they, they, they say, well, you've got to say you physically gave him the money rather than you gave it to one of his assistants, you've got to give it to him personally, otherwise we can't convict him. Mm-hmm. Um, so they could lie about those kind of things or, or lie about whatever um, will be convenient. Um, the, in some ways, the prosecutors didn't really prove their case. Uh, I mean, it, it's hard. And when you get like a jury of like, these are kind of regular New York kind of middle class people, working class people in New York, who suddenly take this, you know, go down, the, take jury duty. It's hard to go against the federal government with this case and this kind of crazy case in Mexico. Um, but I don't think they really proved it on the day in court beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm. Um, they didn't show bank accounts with these, you know, millions or, or really didn't show the money. They kind of had a couple of nice houses in Miami and so forth, but to really show what you're saying or alleging of like more than a hundred million dollars and that kind of thing, they didn't show that money. Now, where is that money or, or how do drug cartels launder their, their, their money? Um, they're very sophisticated about this. And they, they, this is something which is they've, they've done and learned to do over years and years and years of practice because the, the cartels are really these organized crime networks that have grown organically over decades and decades or over a century. So they'll move, um, you know, they'll move dollar bills over the border from the United States into Mexico. Uh, and then they'll put them into businesses. They'll put them through different names, uh, different family members. But then this money can end up in China. It can end up in, um, you know, in Panama. It can end up in, you know, in Switzerland. Um, all these different places and through kind of lists of names. They're, they're pretty clever about doing that or, or in businesses here in Mexico that can be anything from dairies to uh, massage parlors to taco places that you know to football teams um and it just becomes very very difficult to follow it mm, but even for yourself even if it was your own money i would find that one of the greatest nightmares of being a drug dealer <laughs> having to work out where my money was i r- remember all these various codes and people and that's when you, you end know, up company. burying it sometimes in the back garden that's I suppose, exactly yeah no i swear yeah. to god 
Yeah, it's true, isn't it? If you think about like, I mean, like there was a there was recently when when somebody um, bought a house or something for one of the the, the Pablo Escobar family, and then they uh, in the wall they found loads of money stashed in the wall there. Um, you know, oh yeah, it's nine million dollars here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, got a bit that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good point. I mean, people are thinking about uh, the clever drug traffickers, and there are clever ones out there who manage to make a bunch of money, um, do their time, or make some kind of deal, and end up keeping their money, mm -hmm. uh, and they stash it. Yeah, I mean, through businesses, through confidence as fronts for businesses um or do yeah or just literally stashed in suitcases and gradually kind of laundered mm -hmm. and, and um and yeah I mean, i've i've met uh, drug traffickers who flipped into witnesses and so forth who, who who did who came out of this well and did okay it's all like um, a so, so. giant big washing machine isn't it with everybody grabbing what they can as they as they go around. And I always think the money is up there somewhere in the ether, but really it's very difficult to yeah. to show it all. Um, and they say it's also an economy. But Yoan, things are good there, are they? Or apart from all this sort of negativity we've been talking about, you're enjoying life still in Mexico and you've no plans to leave. Still here. I've been here, what, 22 years now. Um, it keeps on coming more and more. And I originally came here to be here two years, arrived here in, in the year 2000, late 2000, with a backpack and a one-way ticket and the dream of being a, a journalist. Um, you know, no idea I'll be doing this uh, 22 years on, uh, talking about all this drug trafficking and stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm still here, still still love Mexico. Uh, I still, uh, still loving writing, got other plans, got a, a, a new book, in the pipeline, which I'll, I'll uh, keep my, my cars to my chest about exactly what it is, but mm -hmm. I'm very excited about a new project. Um, got another, I've got another big uh, narrative podcast uh, project I'm working on as well. It's exciting. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you about that later when it comes for sure. Uh, further down the road and even a dramatic TV series project. So, yeah, plenty of stuff. Uh, still, um, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you're the same, Nicola. You get weary um, covering uh, organized crime, um, drugs, uh, this stuff. It kind of kind of wears you down. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, you know, and it, it's crazy. I mean, talking about, you know, I, I was covering some of these turf wars uh, back in like 2004 when I was looking back kind of young and dumb. Uh, and naive and, and and kind of had a you know optimism and covering some of these turf wars back then and thinking oh this is a kind of crazy thing well maybe people can solve this and 10 years down the road it'd be much better uh, but thinking about some of those things there that was you know almost 20 years ago and some of the kids were not even born who are now the hitmen out there fighting today mm. um some of the people who were the gangsters and and, and the leaders that the capos were like kids then um, nine, ten years old, and now running classes, running turves, the big kind of warlords now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it goes on a uh, new generation, but uh, some point it, it will end. And and I mean, I mean, Mexico, Latin America, it's still one of the, despite everything, one of the greatest place in the world. A uh, great place to be. Um, mm. Great people, great food, great culture. Uh, you know, great country despite it all. Absolutely. There's a lot more to Mexico than just what we end up talking about. But uh, I think the thing is, yeah, you get worn down by it, but it also does organise crime and all that goes around it does keep dragging you back, doesn't it? It keeps, there's, I don't know, you always say that about uh, the criminals. When do they step off the train? We're kind of the same ourselves, are we? Well, it's the famous, uh, uh, yeah, the Godfather quote, they keep pulling me back in. Yeah, <laughs> keep trying to get out, they keep trying to pulling me back in. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's very, very true. I remember seeing as a guy, a good uh, uh, journalist up in the US, Jesus Esquivel. I saw him at the Chapo trial and and he was like, oh, I'm going to leave all the narco stuff. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff I can give you and I'm going to finish this. And then I saw him at the Garcia Luna trial and he was still there <laughs> yeah, four years later. And, and I have to say, yeah, I mean, I, there's been various times I said, like, I've done enough narcos. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm going to do like uh, revolutionaries and I'm going to look at the, I don't know, I'm going to look at the internet, I'm going to look at like uh, something else. I'm going to write a book about food, uh, great Mexican food. Or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all this, uh, this crime stuff does drag us back in. Yeah, it's it very, does. very hard. 
in a way, oh, yeah. it's kind of addictive in itself, isn't it? Yeah. But look, so Blood Gun Money, new edition out. And thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today, Owen. Always great talking to you, uh, Nick. Always great talking to, to you there in, in Dublin. Hope to maybe see, see you all there at some point in the future in, uh, in, in the fair, fair city of Dublin over there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks.